President Obama gave a key political speech last night, but a speech, a political speech with economic importance. And to talk about the economics of the State of the Union address, I'm delighted to be joined here in Davos, Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum by Laura Tyson. She's a professor of the High School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, and a past chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and the National Economic Council under President Clinton. And also Jacob Frankel, the chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International and a past governor of the Bank of Israel. Thank you both for being here today on the Inside Track talking about a very important speech by the president. Now let's imagine President Obama, he's got a muse on one shoulder and a muse on the other. They're both whispering in his ear. One is saying more spending, the other is saying more deficit reduction. I could almost imagine each of you on his shoulders. Did he right strike the right balance between the two in last night's speech? Laura, why don't we start with you? Well, I think the president has both voices, and he's heard both voices. He basically is saying something about the composition of spending. It's very clear in the United States that the interest of the Congress and the interest of the administration, he had, he had a commission that reported on this, is meaningful deficit reduction. But in that process, it's also very important to get the timing right and the composition right. And what he was really focusing on last night is in the deficit reduction, please, please, please pay attention to long-term term investments in research, in infrastructure, in education. The reason for deficit reduction is to create a strong macro environment for the private sector. But those investments in infrastructure, research, and education are also very important investments for the private sector. So it's a combination of both. Jacob, does that just constitute lip service to, de to deficit reduction, or did you hear enough from the president to encourage you that that's a path the U.S. is going to chart when we get the budget next month? Well, like always, the issue is the implementation. Uh, as Laura said correctly, a dollar of spending is having very different impact if it is spending on infrastructure, education, or on some transfer payments. The problem of the United States today is that there has been too little spending on growth-enhancing activities, infrastructure, education, innovation, competitiveness. But we are starting from a very poor situation where the deficit is so large, the debt has increased dramatically. During the past decade, the debt has increased in a way that nobody expected. And against the background of the crisis in the sovereign debt market in Europe, where countries are on the verge of, I don't want to mention the name, no, mention I think, the names. Well, Come on. There is a serious issue in the marketplace that when we come to asset classes, sovereign debt is now perceived as being more risky than what it used to be, and in some places, more risky than even corporates. And okay. That's something which is new. Quickly, Therefore, it is essential that the deficit, deficit reduction is not being compromised. Okay, but very quickly, Laura, before we go to break, yes. and we'll come back afterward, mm -hmm. did the president effectively buy some time for himself with the uh, news that we got yesterday morning about the UK economy sliding back into negative growth in the fourth quarter. Is that a sign to the president and others that there is a price to be paid for austerity? The, the, the sign, I think, is it's a confirmation. The president has been very clear. He was very clear in the tax agreement that he just recently signed with the Republicans that the U.S. economy right now a right uh, approach is additional fiscal stimulus. Bernanke is very clear that the right approach right now is additional monetary stimulus. But that doesn't mean that you don't uh, fail to address in some planning process with the medium-term struggle on entitlement spending and other parts of the budget. So you've got to do both things at once. I think right now what the UK is saying is don't do too much austerity too soon. And I think the US is trying to get the balance right and I think the stimulus this year from the fiscal side on the tax agreement and monetary is exactly right. All right. We are here at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland and returning to our conversation about the economy with Laura Tyson of the Haas School of Business at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and J.P. Morgan Chase International Chairman Jacob Frankel. Uh, Jacob, we were talking before the break about deficits and whether meaningful deficit reduction and austerity is something that we ought to be undertaking right now, uh, especially in the context of what we saw in Britain, a GDP reduction in the fourth quarter. Is that a warning sign to President Obama, the current administration, maybe even the Republican Party, as Laura might suggest, that you can't undertake those kinds of radical steps too quickly, too early in the recovery process. You need to have a long-term strategy. Capital markets are eager to know how this process is going to come to a close. The deficit 
that was started, the stimulus budget, started in order to deal with a recession. And it was supposed to be temporary. The longer it lasts, the more questions are asked, are we in a new paradigm or was it just a detour? I think it is essential to clarify the situation and say how exactly the budget will come back into line. Frankly, the data that I'm familiar is, with is saying that uh, deficits do not produce sustainable jobs and in fact countries with large deficits that last too long are hurting their growth rather than improving their growth. So the fact of the matter is that even for short-term needs, one needs to be cognizant of the long-term consequences. Laura and Jacob, one of the things we didn't hear last mm -hmm. night was any mention really about the need for reform in Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. Now you mm -hmm. talked about, the, you just a, moment, a few moments ago, Laura, said that you have to have a medium-term plan. Medium we don't have a medium-term plan. We don't have a medium-term mention right, right. even. Did the president make a mistake in not explaining to Americans that that's something that we're going to have to get used to? Just preparing them for what is inevitable at some point down the road. I, I th because if you don't hear it now, are we going to hear it before the next election? I think, I think that we will hear it all this year. I think we heard it before uh, the end of last year. We had several major commissions, including a presidential commission, come out with very ambitious uh, long-term deficit reduction plans. They did suggest meaningful uh, changes in our entitlement programs. So I think this is a conversation Americans are having. The Republican majority uh, in the House, the Rep Republican majority in the House has come in and said that they want to try to reduce discretionary government spending by 20 percent. They have not themselves suggested any meaningful ways to reform entitlements. The other thing I want to say about the entitlement issue is, you know, there's been a large uh, criticism of the health care reform that the president passed with the, with the Democratic Congress. The Congress, the Congressional Budget Office and other experts have made the argument that it will actually reduce costs over time by beginning to rationalize the U.S. Medicare system. So I think the there are the administration is taking the issue of medium to long term deficit reduction very, very seriously. The politics of how you talk about it, when you talk about it, how you move on it is a different matter. But I do think the American people have been hearing and will continue to hear the need for meaningful changes in entitlement programs. Jacob, I have to ask you a question about trade and competitiveness. The president talked talked about the need for more competitiveness. He didn't specifically mention who America needs to compete with, but everybody here is talking about China, of course. Has America woken up to the, the economic threat, effectively, that China poses and what the country needs to do in terms of investment in education, transport, um, telecommunic telecommunications infrastructure to meet that challenge in the years ahead? Well, I think that the focus on competitiveness is extremely welcome one. It is welcome because it basically addresses the issues of how to increase the size of the pie rather than how to distribute a pie and cut it into small pieces. I, you mentioned the word threat. I think that what we should hear is a clear statement that China, for example, is an opportunity, not a threat. An opportunity means that we need to engage with them in a win-win strategy. I, for myself, for example, am not very happy from previous efforts that focused only on the exchange rate. Because the fact of the matter is that as long as China saves 50% of every dollar produced and the U.S. saves just 10 cents of every dollar produced, the U.S. will have a deficit with respect to China. And the way to deal with it is to develop with China the strategy that will reduce their need to save, deal with social security system there, deal with pension <laughs> system, deal with why corporates do not distribute dividends. And that's a win-win strategy. They would also like to consume more and have a party. But we need to explain that their future is not endangered by increasing their spending. Well, a win-win, Jacob. I know that you don't always agree, but a win-win strategy for the United States and for China is something I know you can both agree on. Thank Absolutely. you very much for joining me here. <laughs> Jacob Frankel and Laura Tyson.